Okay, so what I intend to do uh, this morning for about 20 minutes is to give you an introduction to Rare Disease Day. And first of all, I want to uh, welcome uh, the 14 schools uh, that are joining us this morning. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you all. And while we would normally prefer you to have you here at, at our beautiful campus, uh, that is not possible currently uh, and actually it gives us the opportunity to welcome schools that because of uh, sheer distance to our campus may not be able to attend presentially. So we are expecting over 400 students from 14 schools to uh, join us today and that is fantastic and thank you very much particularly. Thank you to the teachers in your schools who have coordinated your participation because I know that that takes a lot of effort on their part and, and I want to particularly acknowledge that. And this is an outline of what I intend to cover in my talk today. Uh, it's, it's quite a lot. We will talk about what is a rare disease, what is rare disease day, what is a rare disease, why is this important for our university, I'll remind you a little bit of what genes are and we will discuss their connection to rare diseases. Uh, I'll ask whether uh, genetic mutations are all really bad and I'll show you a little bit of political and research progress and some of the marketed products that are now available for a handful of rare diseases and their pricing. Uh, I'll introduce you to how inspiring uh, people affected by rare diseases can, can be and I'll describe a little bit what the rest of the event is going to be today. That is quite a lot, obviously. So as you can imagine, rather than doing a detailed DALI type painting, uh, I intend to do a quick uh, mirror type painting this morning with uh, wide strokes. Uh, but by all means, uh, you can get back to me or the other participants in our event today for further information if it is of interest to you. So what is Rare Disease Day? Um, Rare Disease Day takes place on the last day of February every year. And the reason for that is that every four years in a leap year is a rare day. And that's why you wrote this decided uh, to celebrate the day on the 28th, on, on the last day of February. And this year for uh, Eurordis is the 15th edition, and for us at Royal Holloway is the 12th uh, time that we celebrate uh, the event. The main goal is to raise awareness uh, of rare diseases amongst the general public and decision makers about rare diseases and their impact on people's lives. And the campaign targets the general public, but also policymakers, public authorities, industry, researchers, and so on, uh, who have an interest uh, in rare diseases. So why are these diseases important? If they are rare, uh, as opposed to, say, cancer or cardiovascular disease, why should we be concerned about them? Well. I can tell you for a start that there is a definition for a rare disease. In Europe, uh, it's one that affects fewer than 1 in 2,000 people. But there are thousands of rare diseases. Uh, if you take them all together, they affect about 7% of people at some stage in their lives. And because often there is very little we can do about them, uh, they actually take a disproportional part of the health budget, 20%. If I tell you 7% of people in the UK, uh, that's actually 3.5 million people and 300 million people worldwide. So we are talking about very, very big numbers of people. And as I say, in addition to that, they take a disproportional part of the budget. In addition, most of these diseases affect children and 30% of them will die before their fifth birthday. So we are talking about very severe diseases. And most of them are inherited. Uh, so they are passed on from parents to children, uh, or in other words, they are genetic. So it's really important to raise awareness about those diseases. 
to highlight just how many there are I normally put up this first page of uh, the rare disease list because there is a list of rare diseases and if we were in a face-to-face -face event and we had a little more time I would ask you to guess how long it would take to read the list of rare diseases allowed if you were going to do that just to give an impression of the, the task in hand and actually it would take you non-stop 18 hours to read this list and if I tell you that there are people who spend their whole life working on a specific rare diseases trying to understand the disease and to develop treatments for it uh, it can give you an idea of you know the, the, the size of the task in addition rare diseases are important because for many of them uh, caused by single genes the therapeutic target has been defined and validated this is a very technical sentence but it actually means that in principle we know what we would need to do to correct the disease the question is whether we can implement that knowledge and a lot of gene therapy and stem cell therapy technology has been developed and tested on rare diseases but is now being applied to more common diseases as well and to give you an example of that obviously you are all aware of COVID-19 and vaccines for COVID-19 and I can tell you that two of the major groups of vaccines for COVID-19 those based on nucleic acids particularly messenger RNA and those based on viral vectors are effectively gene therapy tools uh, and have been those techniques have been developed in the context of rare disease research uh, the messenger RNA vaccines you will be familiar uh, with them under the names of Pfizer and Moderna and the viral vector vaccine you will know it as the AstraZeneca vaccine so as I say key technology developed in the context of rare diseases now being applied to common diseases so why is this important at Royal Holloway well uh, I told you that most of those rare diseases are inherited uh, and as such many are potentially treatable with genetic and stem cell therapies and Royal Holloway has an international reputation in this field so we like to showcase our research and teaching in this area in the context of rare disease day now I'm going to take you a little bit back to remind you what our gene is and what you have in this slide is a human karyotype with the chromosomes painted in blue and those green dots are one particular gene uh, in the two chromosomes the one from mom and dad in the genome so it's just one of uh, maybe 20 odd thousand genes in the human genome and uh, again if I can remind you if you have a normal gene in the genome and what we have here is an outline of a chromosome with a slightly expanded region including a, a typical gene that normal gene would go on to produce a normal protein through transcription and translation but if there is a mutation in that particular gene represented here by this green blob then perhaps you would have an abnormal protein produced or there may be no protein at all and uh, what may the effect of that be uh, well uh, in some cases it's irrelevant uh, you wouldn't notice the difference because there is no major obvious function to the protein in other cases the effect is minor there is an effect uh, but it's uh, nothing that you can live uh, without and evolution is based on mutations so our, our ability to adapt to a changing environment is based on the availability of mutations in fact I would like to say that nowadays we talk about variation rather than uh, mutation because of the sort of negative connotations that that mutation and mutant uh, have as words but 
it can be very different and in some cases a single genetic change in the genome can lead to a very severe uh, inherited disease and I'm just highlighting here two of those many thousands of uh, rare diseases, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy simply because they are two of the ones we work with at Royal Holloway. And one of the lectures today by Professor Linda Popelwell will give you quite a lot of information about her work on Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy. And uh, in a nutshell as well, uh, I introduce here a, a short list of the uh, diseases, both rare and common as well, like the ones at the bottom, uh, that we work with here at Royal Holloway in the context of our gene therapy uh, work. Why is it important to raise awareness about rare diseases? Well, uh, I can tell you that diagnosis of these diseases, because they are rare, because the clinical professionals are not familiar with it, uh, uh, and so on, can take actually five years or longer. Uh, so from when perhaps a, a, the parents take a child uh, to the clinician for the first time because they are concerned about something in their development, until a diagnosis is achieved, it can be five years or longer. I know of, of longer cases. So that obviously, that which is called the diagnostic odyssey, is a very significant issue. And as I told you before, uh, these are complex diseases, uh, often syndromic with uh, many effects, and the care for these people should be done in, in centers of excellence that provide coordinated care. That seems obvious, but actually that's not the way that is being done currently. And trials are being run to try to implement this uh, in the clinic. Uh, but again, this has to be supported uh, to provide the care that this, uh, the people affected need. And uh, in this context, medicine is changing, and now genomics technologies are being incorporated into the uh, national health services. Uh, at the moment, mostly for diagnostic purposes in the context of both rare diseases and cancer, but they will be applied in other areas uh, of medicine uh, in, in time. And the NHS is adapting in order to be able to provide uh, these services because the expertise had to be brought in. The government in the UK is particularly keen to promote uh, the strengths uh, of the country in the context of genomic technologies and there is a, a healthcare strategy, Genome, Genome UK, published in uh, late 2020 uh, that aims to promote and boost uh, this area of, of research and clinical applications uh, in the UK. And furthermore, uh, in 2021, the UK Rare Diseases Framework was published with the idea of providing a vision on how the UK will improve the treatment uh, and the lives of people affected by rare diseases. I should say that a vision is one thing. The implementation of that vision is what can make a difference and that is obviously complicated, but at least there is a national framework uh, for that. If I can put this in context, why is this so important? At the moment in, in, in the UK, when a baby is born, that uh, child would be uh, screened for nine uh, rare diseases. Uh, well, I've told you that there are thousands and thousands of rare diseases. And the reason why uh, children are only screened for f nine, and actually I should say in some NHS trusts that may be up to 20 odd uh, diseases, but still a very low number, is because in principle, uh, little can be done to improve uh, their care, even it's known earlier on that they have a, a rare disease. But things are changing, and it's obviously very important uh, to develop uh, further treatments. So things are changing in this sense. Uh, there are some uh, therapies already available. They come in three, in three flavors. They can be a small chemically synthesized nucleic acids, what we call oligonucleotides, like espinraza, 
or they can be engineered uh, viruses in order to deliver genes that will be able to treat the disease, like Luxturna for a disease in the eye, or Solgensma for a spinal muscular atrophy. Or the treatment can actually be a genetically modified cell from the patient, which is taken from the, uh, from the person affected, uh, engineered uh, in cell culture, and return to the person affected as a genetically modified cell population. As the case of uh, lip melding, which has very recently been approved uh, in the UK. But I'm sure that you have seen the price tags of these medicines. There is no much difference between euros, uh, dollars and pounds at the moment. Uh, and you can see that uh, in principle what is expected to be a one-off treatment for this uh, disease with lip melding is currently the most expensive uh, medicine ever approved and that is a significant problem uh, in the field. Now, uh, Dral Holloway, uh, we have celebrated, as I say, Rare Disease Day for the last uh, 12 years uh, with loads of people participating, as you can imagine, and what you are seeing here is mostly our undergrad and postgraduate students who have helped to run the event uh, over the years. Uh, but for you today, what we are going to have is, after me, we are going to have Dr. Robin Bell from the British Society for Gene and Cell Therapy is speaking on the society. We are going to have Professor Linda Popplewell talking to you about her work uh, on neuromuscular diseases, particularly Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Afterwards, uh, after a little break, we are going to have an exhibition in which uh, Sari Hughes and Blaine Baker are going to tell you about their work of their respective organizations in this, in this area. Uh, after which, you will have a speed dating session in which both our undergrads and representatives from various stakeholder organizations in the field are going to talk to you uh, for a few minutes and then rotate uh, in the course of a 45-minute session. And after lunch break, you are going to have, or most of you are going to have, a lab activity, uh, which has been very generously coordinated by your respective schools, uh, in which you are going to look at the inheritance of an X-linked uh, disease. And at the end, for a few minutes, we will have uh, some evaluation and close. We have some additional resources available on our webpage, so please uh, head for it uh, when you have time. And I just wanted to tell you that people affected by rare diseases, while well, I've told you that they need certainly care and support, can also be incredibly inspirational people, uh, which can achieve fantastic things despite the fact that they are affected by a rare disease. And, and I'm highlighting here Helene Rainsford, who is a Paralympic uh, gold medalist, and she was the patron of our event uh, back in 2012. Uh, obviously, uh, to organize an event like this requires the help of many people, and I want to uh, thank them all, particularly our staff, our students, our exhibitors and the speakers. And uh, finally, I want to encourage you all to consider, when you make career choices, uh, to join the genomic medicine revolution. So you may want to work with us in research, or you may want to work as a clinician uh, in this space. And perhaps if you have a, no interest in either those areas, but you are very good at computers, I can tell you that there is a, an amazing amount of data being generated in the context of genomic technologies and you may want to work in that area as well. And finally, I know that there are many things that you could be doing rather than listen me, listening to me here, so many thanks for your time. But I should say that knowing that most of you are underage, you should forget about those two uh, immediately.